Welcome everyone to Authors on the Air. I'm your host, Pam Stack. We're proud to be part of the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. I have a very special, special guest with me today. Author J.D. Allen is so well known right now for her Sin City investigation. Sin City Investigation series. Let's have a look at the four books in that series. 19 Souls, Skin Game, Body Zoo, and the new one, Flat Black Ford. Thank you. <laughs> it is my pleasure to bring back to the show my friend and award-winning author, J.D. Allen. Hi, how are you, Joel? Nice to see I'm you. Great. I'm great. We're vacationing down in the Keys and trying to catch some sun in between the rainy season down here and just having a good time. Do you find it's easier when you're on vacation to write than when you're home? Because mm. I would think I'd want, to, if I was down in Marathon, I'd want to be out on the water all the time. Of course, you live near the water when you're home anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm, in, I'm, I'm in St. Augustine and I'm, we try to go to the beach two or three mornings a week at least, you know, well, generally, you know, sometimes it's gotten, a, it's this time of year gets really hot up yes. there. So, you know, July and August, not so much, but through the winter and spring. So I get home and clean up and then write. So it's kind of my cleanser in the morning. Down here, we're on a uh, on one of the, the keys and uh, we have a, what do you call it? Canal out front. We watch the boats and manatees and stuff go by, but it's, I can write out there, I can write in here, you know, but at home, you know, my husband works at home. My mother lives with us. Six cats. There's there's a good bit of distraction at the house because I can't. You know, I used to go off and write occasionally too, just to have a different space. So being down here is is good, and I'm barreling in on a on a deadline and the end of the book. So all's good. Let's start with your first book. Your lead character in this series is Jim Bean. And it's obviously set in Sin City. Hello, Las Vegas. <laughs> and so uh, it's easy to figure out where the location is. Tell us how you came up with Jim Bean, your character, and a little bit of his background, please. Okay. Well, you know, I, I originally wrote this, you know, the, that first book in the series. You know how long it takes to sell the first book right. in the series sometimes. So I wrote it probably nine years ago, the first book was written. And a very good friend of mine had been accused of sexual assault and um, falsely. He was actually, he was one of my financial planner, a young man with everything going, college, going on his way. And you know, that, that Google search kind of ruined his career. Oh my God. And um, he got mad. And he didn't deal with it all that well, but he dealt well with it better than Jim Bean did. So Jim Bean is not his real name. And you find that out early in the books and it becomes a joke because everybody thinks we're saying beam as in the whiskey. whiskey. And then he makes a green bean joke or something to it. And he kind of uses that to judge how the person he's interrogating is, is feeling. Somebody's real uptight, they don't get the joke. Yeah, anyway. So that's how Jim Bean came to life. And I decided if I was gonna leave middle Ohio mad and as an alcoholic to go set up somewhere else, where would I go? You either go to Miami or you go to Las Vegas. That's all there is right. to it. Yeah. And I, it, my, my late husband and I had a somewhat of a love affair with Vegas through the eighties and nineties before he passed. So I was familiar with the vibe of the city, although it's well different than it was, you know, especially in the, the mid to late eighties, but. I, I kind of live with it as if it's in that right at the end of the mob time. Mm -hmm. Although it's not placed in that time, but I kind of try to keep that Vegas feel. Right. So uh, in 19 Souls, he, uh, he gets hired by a woman to look for her brother, but it turns out that she's actually looking for someone she wants to kill. So thus, the first cat and mouse in the series starts that way. You know, I think I was just reading something in the paper or one of the feeds, I don't get the paper, I read it online, but about a woman who hired a hitman to kill her married boyfriend's wife. And this <laughs> was apparently a college student. And she went on the dark web to find the hitman. What's the truth? I was only reading this a few weeks ago. Went on the dark web to find the hitman. The hitman was so appalled 
Then he called the FBI. <laughs> the hit man did. I'm thinking about the kind of cash I had in college and not thinking I would have afforded the best hit man well, available. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how the story unraveled. I don't know if the boyfriend was giving her money or what, but, but um, <laughs> it was just, you know, don't hurt the kid, just bump off the wife. And all I want is photographic proof. And I always think when I read stories like that, this can't really be happening, but you know, it does. So at the, all, all, criminals by and large are not the brightest people in the planet. Well, yeah. That guy you know? <laughs> from South Carolina, whose son and wife were murdered. And then he shot in the head along, uh, you know, it's been all the newspapers today. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That lawyer turns guy. Out, turns out he hired the guy to kill him. <laughs> so the son would get the $10 million life insurance policy. And now he's under arrest. And well, he's a lawyer. He, he's a disgraced lawyer because he, well, but he's <laughs> he and he claims he was an alcoholic and going into rehab. I'm thinking, you don't have to have a vivid imagination to write fiction. You just need to read the newspaper. And, and you know, there is some, some truth in that. Um, yeah. I, I, you, know, you don't have to look far. Uh, no. I try to, I, I typically, my books all have a little bit of a cause behind them. Mm -hmm. You know, 19 souls, the female serial killer was right. long term emotional trauma dealing right. with uh, skin game. The second book, he took on a case that turned out to be human, a human trafficking case. Of course, you know, he's the the grumbly P.I. who's whose cases always blow up into something huge. Right. You know, right. Kind of maverick or, or um, sorry, not maverick. Uh, Rockford meets Jack Reacher. You know? Right. I was going to say Reacher for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they do. They read a lot like Reacher books. Uh, they're short chapters, choppy, you know, fast paced sentences. So, but anyway, so the skin game, he, you know, he's just looking for some girl's sister. And it turns out she was trying to infiltrate a, a, a trafficking thing. Um, so that's a, you know, once I, I at Writers Police Academy, I, I learned a lot about human trafficking from a couple of the police officers that were dealing with it. And I, right. you know, just the, you know, it's it's Horrible. easy to say human trafficking and people think, oh, that's awful. But when you actually start looking into some of how, how gritty that gets. Yeah. So Skin Game wanted to be, you know, a little more gritty in that. And um, Body Zoo, I spent a lot of time with a taxidermist. That's just all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, we don't want to give all that away. <laughs> it is a fascinating book. But your titles, my gosh, your titles are so good. Um, and, and as you know, we had a thread going on my Facebook page about the mm -hmm. titles of your books. And everybody just loves them. I think Shane even said he was going to, he was going to like take a riff off some of your book titles. I love that. I, you know? I think he was more interested in the branding of the, you know, the cut the map. Severin River Publishing's done a really great job of branding me. They yeah. they took some yeah. time to make sure they knew who I was and what my my stories were about. And you know, there's not a lot of PI thrillers out there. So no. we wanted we wanted the look of the PI, but we also needed that the texture that you get the idea that this is more than a you know, it's not a noir. It's it's hard boiled in the fact that there's language and sex and and you know. Blood on the page for sure. Yeah. We have but, a we have a, um, a message from Mary Alice Van Stavern. I always think that everything written in books I read has actually happened somewhere in the world. Well, unless you're reading fantasy or paranormal or science fiction, you're absolutely right. It's somewhere in a book. <laughs> well, I, I, go ahead. No, no, continue. I like I said we were talking about the headlines, you know, and and when you're looking into things that people experience and, and the emotional and physical trauma and damage that they go through through doing that, you know, we take those things you see in the headlines and kind of drag them down personally. Now, some people use real cases, you know, Jess Rat Lowry's new books right now are all kind of based on stuff that happened right. in her childhood crimes that went on in her life. Um, unfortunately, Flat Black Ford is kind of that one for me. That's kind of my personal story of some trauma I dealt with. And it was about halfway through the book that I realized that I was working that out myself. So let's talk about the story. Um, let's get, you get to have the elevator pitch or the long walk down the hallway <laughs> or up the stairs, however you want to do it. Up the beach. Tell us a little bit about Flat Black Ford. 
And for, so, by the way, for, for listeners and readers, Jules and I have a hard time saying that real fast. Yeah. He's a little dyslexic in our own way. So if, if yeah. you have a hard time with language, try saying that one three times real fast, or if you've had so, tequila shots. Okay. Yeah, so it's flat black forward. And yeah. um, I actually just call it FBF when I'm talking to anybody about it, because I have such a hard time saying it out loud. But it, uh, it, the case he's working on this one is a, a woman comes to him and is wanting him to find her daughter, which is not unusual, except they kind of know where she is because she had been on the evening news the night before for robbing a bank. So he needs to find her before the police do because he's worried she's going to do the suicide by cop thing. Okay. Um, of course, it gets much more complicated than that, but that's what starts his case. Like I said, it always kind of starts as a case. All I got to do is find this girl right. before the police do and hand her to my buddy, Detective Miller, right? That's all I got to do. And uh, Oscar Olson, who we call double O or O in the books, is a bounty hunter, skip tracer friend of his that talks him into taking this case. So they start after, her name is Stella DeSoto, and she has a plan that she wants to just make her way south, hit the coast, keep going, and just not be found. She has some trauma. She was sexually assaulted as a very young girl and hit by a truck when she was running away from him, hit by his truck, I should say. So as a, it scarred her emotionally and physically. So she's, you know, she's got scars on her face and people have not treated her well, you know, because of her appearance. So she's decided she's just done with life. So the story is chasing her down. It's a cross country high story and it was it's a little bit different it's not quite as gritty as my other books until you really get into her emotional part of it it's a little light it was the first book i wrote during the pandemic you know just i was just into it as the pandemic started and i i couldn't go anywhere so it was like okay what can i do to get out of here in my head so i just took off cross country with stella and that's where we go <laughs> i know you've traveled a bit but you are the I think the number one conference goer in the history of writer conferences. You oh, have, I wouldn't say that. You I have do. all of the lanyards. I know I've seen the lanyards <laughs> in, in your room. <laughs> so was it easy enough for you to follow Stella in her footsteps as she made her way across country? Did you it, know where she, she did. Her, uh, her, she knew where she was going and she had a very, she had a very clever plan. Uh, if I get if I get too into it, then it kind of gives it away. But yeah, she planned this for years. This wasn't wow. something she just did on a whim. So I did. I went a couple of places. Um, there was a few places I had to because I'd not been there and couldn't go. Which if if it had not been pandemic time, I'd have got my ass in my car and drove across country and written it. As oh, I, I have no doubt. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, so. I had to use Google Earth a bit to find a certain bank here or a gas station here right, to, right, right. to be able to give enough information that at least I was believably in Alga, Albuquerque at the time. Albuquerque, there's another one. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, when I was writing that, I just typed ABQ and did a search and research <laughs> for Albuquerque. You, the you, you, know no the airline, that you know the airline numbers, the airline abbreviation. <laughs> So <laughs> I want to go back to the beginning. How would you just tell me if you were describing Jim Bean, what he looks like? How old is he? Well, he's in his mid forties. Um, Cause that's about the age I was, you know, early forties when I started writing him the first time, like so that he sat on the shelf for a little bit, but um, he's in his mid forties. He's, he's got some darker hair with a little bit of salt and pepper starting to show up in it. He's a big guy. You know, he's a little intimidating for some people and, you know, not for others. You know, he's not giant, but he's not skinny either. I, I try not, I try not to describe my characters too awful much because right. I want people to live with them in their head. Right. So much so that my husband at one point thought that, uh, Oscar Olson was black. He goes, he's not black. 
<laughs> no, he's not in my head he is, but evidently he is in yours. So I try to give people more characteristics of them than too many. They each have something specific. You know, Oscar's hair is long and, and salt and pepper, and he talks like Sam Elliott, right? <sighs> That's about the whole description of him. You know, That's great. <laughs> he's long and lanky and that. Uh, Eli, my crazy old 70-year-old Vietnam veteran, you know, has the stick up gray hair is still very muscular and does wacky things like decide he's going to speak with a Spanish accent for three or four weeks and won't speak to you any other way except with, with a really bad Spanish accent, you know, so everybody's got their thing. And so, I, I, I like, I like people to kind of build them in their heads. I hear you. Um, it, you know, you mentioned about not many PI thrillers and immediately Bob Grace came to mind because of Joe Pike and Elvis. So, right, 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 right. Um, so, and it's funny because every time I talk to him, he, he says, I never describe either of them in the book, except for, you know, you know about Pike's tattoos, mm -hmm. you know, his forward facing arrows, but you, you don't know. And he, and I said, do you know what they look like? And he said, yeah, but I just, I don't want to tell anyone. I want them to figure it out. And I, th and then I heard him reading from his book and it was very interesting to me, Jules, that the way he reads dialogue from his characters is very different from the way I read it. So oh, hearing yeah. the author say it is very different from the way I'm reading it. And, and I love good dialogue. So, do you think when you read dialogue, it's gonna it's gonna change the way I see the character? Or probably it, so. Yeah. Probably yeah. so. I've yeah. done several yeah. no, noir at the bars, and what yeah. I tend to do when I read is I have some short stories that I wrote just to be read that are not jumping. Okay. Um, that I like to do just because it's more my voice because it's really hard for me to pull off two male characters believably right. in a bar with a lot of noise going on sure, sure. but um the audiobook started coming out this year so the first three i think are already out and the guy reading um has drop dead sexy voice i'm telling you <laughs> So I was stuck the other day, and so I went out in my car and drove around and listened to Jim Bean talk for a little while. I'm like, wow, he really nailed that. But you know, I got to pick him though, which is nice. I got to I got to have a say in in the reader. And um, as a matter of fact, you know, I they're they're PI books, but they are dual POV often. Sure. I think Skin Game's the only one that's not. Everyone else, you get like Stella's POV while she's trying to hunt down someone. You I like get that. her POV on how much that Ford truck means to her and, yeah. you know, how she feels about running. And I think that makes what Jim's doing to investigate, I think it gives the reader a little more, you know, they're bought in more, either oh, for or against. Oh, yeah, because, because yeah, they hear her voice as the victim. Bad yeah. guy, maybe not. The bad guy. You know, right. um, the, the best compliment I've gotten in a long time is someone who had gone back and read 19 Souls after reading something else. And, you know, that female serial killer is pretty creepy. And she's like, oh, my God, halfway through it, I caught myself rooting for her. And then I went, ew. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I was yeah, like, yes. Florida, of course. Then again, we had Eileen Warnock, who was the infamous serial, female serial mm -hmm. killer. So, um, you know, regardless, she was still a horrible person. She got, well, yeah. She, she's, all, yeah. You know. she has a little different issue than, than my Sophie did. Absolutely. But, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So what would you say are Jim's best characteristics and his most irritating characteristics? Um, his best, I, I think he's really trying not to be angry at the world for what happened to him. And we get a little bit less of that in each book, but I try to have something bring it back up so we understand him, especially if somebody picks it up in the middle of the series. Sure. Um, so I love that he's trying and knows he's like, he's, he's done with his anger management classes. <laughs> That way. Now he's trying to work, let, work it, right? Right. They'll let him carry a gun now. So <laughs> he's trying to work. 
and you know he's the he hangs out at this diner across the street from his townhouse where his office is that got turned into a vegan restaurant which he freaking hates right you know everything in there is baby shit green and his <laughs> He's right. So, but he still goes there because it's right, right across right. the street. And the waitress, Sandy, has graduated to where she's now his assistant. So he has brought her, you know. Well, he's allowed her in, too. And, and allowed right. her in. So he's, he's allowed her in. So it's, it's kind of that little tight-knit group. Um, he's still a bit of a sexist. And I... I I left that in there on purpose because now he's dealing with it while he's noticing he's doing it in front of Sandy. Right. So now when he's, you know, he has to, he talks to the strippers and the strip clubs and all this stuff and he's friendly with them and he's, you know, turns to say something that would be horribly sexist and go now. So he's <laughs> growing. Oh, he's, he's growing. growing. And I think that's a good way to show that that happening. How do his cases affect him? Oh, deeply, usually, because like I said, they usually blow out completely. And, and, and especially in Flat Black Ford, he really gets to kind of understand this woman that he chases quite literally from Vegas to Key Largo, you know, around the country. So I, I'm, he he does. He they almost always end up always end up pretty personal. Yeah, I don't I don't know what the story is going to carry if he doesn't carry about his cases and if it doesn't affect him somehow. I think that's where I, I was know. going with it because a lot of times, you know, I wonder if there are reper repercussions from the prior book, even though your books can read as standalones. Mm -hmm. It's I mean. I happen to like the way that he changes mentally and emotionally, but some books I notice, you know, the character, his growth re or her growth remains static. And that, it, it, I want to say, God, didn't this affect you at all? Have you no emotional connection to your course? Okay, so now I'm going to talk about, some of the, you know, the publishing end of business. Right. A lot of times, you know, like, you know, I'm, I'm writing, Six, five, five right now. You know, his growth, is, his arc is pretty long, but if they want me to go to 15 books, he either has to crash and have another arc. Right. Or at some point you have to kind of hold that out. You know, you have to sure. stretch out that arc. Um, you layer it, right? You got to layer, layer it. it. Well, of course you layer it, but at some point, you know, he can't be a sexist monster. He's not a sexist monster. That's a, a bit of, but he can't, if he's learning not to be sexist and, and, and critically thinking about it, I can't drag that out for books. No, no, I understand that. Yeah. Right. You see so what I'm saying? It depends on, where, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I guess it depends on what your character arc is over. Well, so that's my question. Is there a point where you take the rubber band on this arc and it snaps and then you have to go mm -hmm. get a rubber band? Mm hmm sure. Yeah. I, I think if you can find a way to do that with the same character is that how is series right. have good longevity. If you have the same character that never changes, you have a harder time keeping your audience caring. Right. You know, this is the same old book. This is the same old exactly. book. Exactly, that's what I'm thinking. It, it would be, you know, it brings to mind, like, my friend Matt Coyle, your friend Matt Coyle, you know, he um, he's coming out with Last Redemption. But last year's book was Blind Vigil, where Rick Cahill lost his vision. And that was a major change in the story that it called for all kinds of new things to go on. Now, I'm not giving away Last Redemption because that's due out in November. But but it was a brilliant piece of work. He won the, the Seamus for it. It was so good. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, his was hardback. I, I, I was nominated in the, the, in the paperback. In the network, I had to kind of root for him. I know. Oh, I love him to death. I love no, him to great. death. He won, yeah, he won for hardback. Uh, yeah. I was nominated in the you know paperback original, and uh, James D.F. Hanna yeah. took it. Yeah, yeah, but his books are really good, too. Yeah, they are. So, 
They're excellent. Yeah. And your books are good too. You know, <laughs> Thank this, you. this is not easy voting nowadays, I think, because so many wonderful books are coming out. I know people think that it's it's been stale in publishing for a couple of years. It has not been. I have written some of the best books I've ever read over the past two or three years with no, authors no. moving up the ranks and just really shining. You know, our friend Sean Cosby, who is amazing and, you know, and of course, Jess. I'm so happy and, to see you. Yeah. Yeah. And Jess and, and Lori and everybody, they just have magnificent books. I would hate to be a judge on a lot of those things for sure. So you are now working on book number five. You have a working title, which is? Uh, Bricks and Bones. Bricks and bones, I love it. Well, wow. the, the, the brick being the brick being a brick from Lizzie Borden's fireplace, boy, and bones being a bone that's actually a key to something. So, so uh, how do you, you know, go back to Matt? He said titles are his hardest thing. You have the best titles in the world. How <laughs> in the world do you title your books? I am a lucky son of a gun, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, like 19 Souls was actually titled 19 Crimes. Okay. And the publisher already had, some, which is a good title as well, but the publisher already had somebody in their um, sales booklet for that quarter with the word crime in their title. So they asked me to change it. So I came up with Souls. Oh, I think it's and, a, uh, and I loved it. I loved it. It's a very um, dynamic title. And I, I, try to, I try to pick something that's a little gritty that is, is short and sweet, but kind of tells you the meat of the story, you know, and like I said, flat black Ford, it's a cross country chase book. So it's all about that truck that she built, right? It's, yeah. it's all about, you know, her escape. That, those, that quad picture again of your book titles. I just want to show everyone how creative and how good you're being marketed. Um, Roman should be able to bring that up in just a second. The, the titles are excellent. And so is the artwork on your, there it is. 19 souls skin game. Body Zoo and Flat Black Ford, which I have to say quietly, thank you. Um, the Sin City Investigation series will have brick and bones. Bricks and bones. Bricks and, Bricks bones. and bones. And when will we see that book? I believe, it, I, I think they already have it up on pre order for like June, but I believe they're going to pull that into sometime in March. You know, I'm, I'm writing two books a year right now. Oh my gosh. I want to talk to you a little bit about your prior writing as a romance novelist. <laughs> okay. So when did you start writing romance and why did you leave it? <laughs> because, you know, a lot of people are going to faint when I say that, especially people who want to be published. I accidentally got published in romance. I was, my late husband was ill. Uh, I was the closest writers chapter me at the time was Romance Writers of America. So I joined that just to be around some other writers and I made a really good friend and, and uh, uh, an author named Samantha Kane who wrote really naughty romantic historicals. And it was coming up Christmas time and she's like, you need to write something light and fluffy because I was trying to be Stephen King. I, you know, I was you know, like, I want to write these really dark horror novels. And uh, she goes, you need to write something light and fluffy. And uh, her publisher was doing a call for weddings. And like I said, they're, they're erotic romances. They're, they're naughties. And I thought, I can't do that. She's like, I, just something short, just, just for me. And so I wrote something and it was silly. I didn't want to say stupid because it wasn't stupid. It was silly. It was about a pug wedding, you know, like dogs where the lady that was holding the pug wedding was a big Dallas oil lady. And it was a, a big, uh, a big to do to have the dog wedding to make money for the S yes, SPCA. Right. And the event planner and her son got together and fell in love and, and short, sure, funny. And I, I sent it to Nancy. She's like, this is funny. And about, Oh, I don't know. Two months later, I get a phone call. This is back when they still called you and said, this is so-and-so from so-and-so. Could you write that book into a novella? You're going to pay me to write? Yes. I sent in the novella a month later. Can you make it a novel? Short story, long, long story longer. Uh, it was like 11 books later. I said, I, 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 I don't want to write. 
<laughs> so, I, I, I finally had to, to draw, you know, to draw the line. I, you know, it was hard. My, my agent dropped me at the time because I'd gotten an agent from it and I was making decent money and everybody's like, what? You're going to do what? <laughs> like, you know, I have a degree in forensic anthropology. I would really like to kill people. You know? There you go. It makes but sense. To me. <laughs> that being said, the relationships in my book are more complicated than a lot of thrillers and mysteries get. Because of that, that was great writing practice. My editor was fabulous. So I learned a lot. It was it was a good proving ground. And, you know, if I want to put a sex scene in my thrillers, I can do so because I know how. <laughs> so, there. But you continue to write. Is there, would you like to write dark horror sometime? I, my horror would, I guess dark, dark horror is probably, I was much more like, supernatural thriller i guess yeah. i should say so really I wrote, thinking. yeah 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 i have one you know i've got like three in the closet so to speak you know one was about the vortexes in sedona arizona oh, what yeah. happens when those actually crack open and you know just yeah but this i think this is my home i it, i don't see until it's not until it's right. not, I, I have another PI series in, in mind that I'd like to write that is a, a female male partnership one with a female protagonist. Like you know, you didn't ask me the question everyone always asks me though is, how hard is it to write a male POV? No, I'm not gonna do that because <laughs> women write male POVs better than men write women's POVs. And I could be wrong, but- I, You know what, Lee Goldberg, writes a his female yeah. his, 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 his he his is really good. Yeah, good. yeah, yeah. His, but, good. Yeah, I agree with but you. But in general, Jeff Deaver does a good job with that too. Yes. Um yeah. those are the two that I can think of off the and top my, of my, my head. My podcast partner who who writes um the Jessica Ramirez uh the series, he writes a fantastic female lead and he's very, very good at it. Now, I always say, I think it's because his wife kind of looks over his shoulder when he's writing. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. But but he knows the dialogue is spot on. So my my criteria, and I don't know if this is the way it is with you, I want to be able to read dialogue between a, a female character and a man and not have he said, she said as the qualifier. I want to be able to know which is the female speaking and the male speaking based on their vocabulary, you know, yep. the, the, the tenor. There's the a lot of things you can do without having to say he said, she said, even yeah. when it's two men in the room, if you've got exactly. enough character built in, just action tags tell you. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> Hang now I want to make mention that you are um, you are also kind of a mentor to a lot of writers. You happen to I try to be. I'm sorry, my battery's going. I'm, I'm plugging in here. Plug in your computer. I am. I am. A, I try to be a mentor. I I try to participate. <laughs> See, <laughs> I try to um, I participate in in writers organizations and and try to do what I can to help other people. I've pitched a million times. I've changed genres. I've, I'm on my third agent. They got a really good one. Um, you know, so I, there's a lot that I can help newbies. I'm in a critique group with with some newer writers, and and I I enjoy that, and I feel like that keeps me fresh too, and doesn't let me get to well. I have five books out. Well, you know, which in my brain, my, as I always said, I have 16 booked out because right. of my romance novels. But I just, you know, sometimes I think, and, and I don't think we see it that much anymore, but there was a, a time period there when I first started, I felt a little bit unwelcome. And I don't know if it was because of the romance stuff or just I walked in at a weird time, but it didn't last long. And I've met the right people. And I just want to do what I can to make sure nobody feels that. Well, here's the thing I notice about you is you are a great participant in things. I know that you were um, you were on the book for BoucherCon. You were the location co um, coordinator for St. Pete, which to me was the best one I ever had. I mean, Aaron was, but you were heavily involved in that. Uh, I, I, yeah, not really. I, I was support for. Oh, you for did. 
You were there. I was support for that one. I was support for Dallas. I was support right. for, you know, the board is there to help the right. LOCs. And hopefully. now here you are with Mystery Writers of America, Florida chapter, and you are the vice chair for the that. president. I think they call it that. The yeah. Michael. Charles Todd called and asked. And when Charles calls you, it's really hard to say no. <laughs> hard to say no to someone who is so well known and particularly yeah. because of the law. He's, um, yeah. he's such well, a sweet. Well, this was a year and a half ago. Yeah. I haven't, I got to go to one live meeting before all this happened. So uh, Alan Orloff is our, our president. And yeah. he's just moved to Florida as well. Recently, I know. I said, welcome to Hurricane Town, you know. And right, right. There were these giant bugs out there. And I said, oh, welcome to cockroaches, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And, everything. He's a and, and grasshoppers, you know, like That's the size it. of a hot dog. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that was the one that shocked me, you know. North Carolina on the beach. Anytime you're on the beach, you get the cockroaches. It's just part of it, you know. But when I saw, I was walking through my yard and a grasshopper the size of a hot dog right. like landed on my foot. That was when I went, oh, Christ, where am I in Jurassic Park here? <laughs> I'm telling you, yeah, it is. It's the land of strange things, you know, here. Um, and strange people. Yeah, very, yeah. like I said, pick, <laughs> pick up a paper, news, a newspaper anywhere in Florida and as Craig Pittman says, who's up in Tampa, you know, who, who writes the ultimate Florida man stories and the crazy things about Florida, there's always something going on. Oh so, yeah, um, I send him pictures. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't want to keep you forever, but I do want to wrap by asking you a few things. Um, you know, when you look back on your life as a writer and where you started and where you are now, what did you know? What do you know now about yourself that you didn't know then? Well, you mentioned the dyslexia, and, and that's something I've been trying to talk about lately. It was in my Big Thrill article. You know, I grew up not knowing I was dyslexic. I barely passed through high school. I started college and quit. And I finally, I, I don't know what my drive was to go back to college so bad, but I had this, I think it's just my dad always wanted me to graduate college. I want you to go to college, blah, blah. So I finally, you know, through getting married and moving around, I ended up at Ohio State and I was in an anthropo an archeology span class of all things, where I had to write a short essay, you know, like on the back of the paper. And the guy called me up, you know, can you come up after class? And I thought, well, here we go again. I'm going to have to drop another class because he's going to take off because I can't write with crap. And uh, he said, you know what dyslexia is? And I said, yeah, I, I, but, you know, I did good with my numbers, just like you said. You know, I did. And he's like, no, no, honey, no. See, so mine gave me numbers, though. Yeah, it's right. Mine, mine is letters. It's spatial. It's using right. the wrong word. It's the wrong filing system. So he sent me to the resource center at Ohio State. And that day my life changed forever. I have been wanting to tell stories since I was a kid. I did theater because I could memorize things and do it outside. I could I could write the plays and do all that in high school and I did okay with that. But you know, it's the, the for the first time I was given the tools to know I was not stupid. Wow. And wow. that was the day that I decided I wanted, that I was going to do this. Now it took me, you know, I had to get a real job. I had to do all this other stuff. It took sure, me sure. a long time to get there. But that was the day that I realized that I could do this. That, and, and of course, now there's so many great tools that help me. Sure. You know, it, it's even easier. If I had to sit down on a, you know, old type tick, 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 typewriter, right. I, I'd never be able to do it. But do you know Simon Wood? I do. Simon is severely dyslexic. He, he's profound. I'm, you know, he's if you do the scale, dyslexic. if you do he's, the scale like this, I'm about here and he is way he over has, here. You know, he is a pilot. He's a race mm -hmm. car driver. He, he, and he's brilliant. And, um, he's learned to do all those things when he was both in the UK. And then when he came over here and it's a really interesting talking to him and he's funny as the day is long. So. Oh yeah. He's hilarious. He's oh, hilarious. Yeah. Actually there's several, there's, a, there's, there's quite a few people in our community that are dyslexic. Josh Stallings yes. is, is also right. very dyslexic. And then, um, and I'm, I'm not even going to be able to pull the word up now The uh, Jamie Mason and I both have it where you can't picture things in your head either. Right. right, right so right. if you close your eyes and say ballerina, if you can see that. 
Yeah, she posted so, about that, yeah. Yeah, so I have that as well, which makes me be able to describe better, I think, because I have to describe from memory and not from an image. But anyway, so that was the biggest thing that changed my life with, with writing. And part of the reason why I went ahead and took the wrote the romance novels, it was just I was so incredible that somebody was paying me to do something I thought I'd never get to be able to do. So to get to do it and to be around this tribe of people who do it, uh, I, I don't read as fast as everybody else. I'm not as well read as everybody else because of that. But you know what? I got audiobooks now help. Although I still like to read a real book, even yeah. though it's, I'm much slower at it. Interesting. Um, you know, I, um, I'm always fascinated by alternative choices. So in another world where there were, was no writing, what do you think you'd want to do? Hmm. Well, I thought I wanted to be a nurse. I really did. You know, uh, I, I actually worked as an EMT for a little while, but it didn't take long. That was before I knew I was dyslexic. I didn't take very long to figure out that that was not a good fit. So I ended up in the morgue for a little while. That would not be it. Um, I mean, your flight of I, if I let my, you know what, I'd want to be, I'd want to be a, a fishing captain, a fishing boat, have a little charter boat captain. I really enjoy being on the water growing up. My dad always had us on a lake or on the beach, you know, even though we tried, he was in the air force and we traveled along. Although I think I'm seasick now, which is ridiculous <laughs> because I've been on boats my whole life. It's like, can you, you grow into being seasick? And he's like, yeah, it can happen with your hormonal changes. And I'm like, really? One more thing you're going to take away from me is <laughs> boating for God's sake. But I, I found a, a physical therapist thing to help with that that I haven't managed to get done yet because you have to stay sober for a really long time to get through the PT. <laughs> Poor Judy Allen. I have loved speaking to you. I always have a good time whenever we talk anyway, but it's been, you know, we've never really had a lot of time together for us. To no, we don't because at conferences you're always running and I'm always running. I'm trying to yeah. send everybody down to interview and you're saying, I'll, I'll see you later, Pam. I'll see you later. And we're both dashing in opposite directions. Anybody you want to give a shout out to or say hello to? Uh, I, hey, everybody. Uh, Cheryl and my, uh, my critique group, Tammy and James Fapko and Jim Ferris are all really good up and coming writers. I hope people see soon. Uh, I, uh, Matt, I was, I, we were trying to go back and forth so he could blurb flat, flat forward, but it didn't work out timing wise. So I'm going to thank him for offering to do bricks of bones. So remind him of that nudge, nudge. Right. <laughs> there you go. I'm going to send the video to him, but just for him. <laughs> Tell just just so you know, you've been nudged. <laughs> tell, tell, tell us, uh, tell everybody where we can find you on the web. Uh, I am at JD Allen books with the S.com. Um, and Facebook, I, I, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I don't, you know, again, with the dyslexia, Twitter and Instagram go really, really fast. And I, I don't, I'm much better on Facebook. Just I would like everything to, to your Facebook page and let it feed there. That's what I do. I don't yeah. go in on any of those things. And I am really the biggest tech twit, which is why you met my producer, Roman, in the green room. Uh, <laughs> JD, will you come Oh, and thank you, Roman. <laughs> and will you come back and do a guest hosting gig with somebody you like? Sure. Yeah. Anytime. All right. Finish your October 1st book, your deadline for your book. Yeah. Yeah. And then see, my deadline's a month earlier than it really is because I have to get somebody to dis to get the dyslexia out of it before I turn there it in. There you go. So. There you go. It is, uh, I've loved talking to you. And, and by the way, happy anniversary. Thank you. And, it's Friday. Um, no, how wonderful. Congratulations. Thank all the thank good you. things happen to good people that I love, and I'm so glad. And I want to thank all of our listeners and viewers today. Uh, you can find more of our shows on um, our website at authorsontheair.com. We archive all of our shows, whether they're audio or video, in SoundCloud at Authors on the Air and on YouTube at Soft, uh, uh, Authors on the Air. You can find them everywhere, though. We're on every platform available in 152 <laughs> countries. No excuses not to listen. Thanks for being here, everybody. And thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Pam.